Welcome to another episode of Give It A Nudge. Today we are on site, which is always some of my favorite episodes. I love getting into new environments, new light, and we are in the beautiful offices of Honey, and you are about to meet Richard Joffe. Very excited to uh, be here interviewing him. I approached him a few weeks back after there was a few massive announcements, and there might be a few more today. So welcome, Richard. Nice to see or you. Or should Thanks you say welcome me. to me, because I'm in your space Welcome today. to our home, Mikasa Sukasa. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love this office, by the way. Yeah. So we're right down on the water in... The, is it, what, what is this Keys. wharf? It's Circular Key Wharf, is that what it's called? Yeah. It's, it's uh, above all those little restaurants near exactly. the hotel. Exactly, we've converted a restaurant actually. Yeah, it's, well, I yeah. think it's super cool, I love all the exposed, exposed Yeah, it's work. called the Campbell Stores. So. Oh, that's it. I yeah. Of course it is. Yeah. But it's beautiful. So, you've got to do things differently, right? So. You've got to do two things different. Well, this is your, I think this is your quintessential, I don't know, are you still a startup? I think you've gone into scale, scale up. up now. I think you've gone into scale you up. You drew a line a month yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. But I think it's a typical office for that. It's yeah, good. Totally. But let's give our audience a little bit of context because yeah. they may not have heard of Honey. I'm sure they have, but they may not have. So give us a quick pricey. What is Honey? Uh, so Honey Insurance is a digital insurance company. Yep. We specialize in home insurance. Uh, we're trying to do, you know, I moved to Australia about five, five or six years ago, and I noticed that insurance was just way, way behind what you were seeing in Europe and America. I moved from San Francisco. Yep. And, um, you know, part of that was that no one's really digitized it very well, meaning super easy to buy it yep. and easy to make a claim. It's just, it's very painful. Yes. Uh, no one's really doing anything for an insurance customer, so we give away free technology and sensors and we're working on services to really actually reduce claims for people, okay. which is a big deal. Uh, and then no one's using data very well, so no one's personalizing the price based on your behavior, you being safer, your house being better, et cetera, right? And so we're trying to build kind of a 2.0 right. insurance company specializing in home because it's mandatory and um, everyone's got to have it, but no one seems to like it. So No one likes it. We've got, uh, but those we seem, can do better. Those seem like pretty standard things, like common sense things, to price it based on the, some of the things you're talking yes. about. So how is it, like if you go back to more traditional insurance, obviously yeah. they ask your address. Is it just loosely done on a suburb and it, rather than a real, is that, doesn't go down to the granular level, is that what you mean? Yeah, I, I think the, maybe a little different way to think about it is, you know, in Australia most industries is an, are oligopolies. Yep. And so there's kind of two to five players in that industry. And the dynamics of an oligopoly are very unique versus the dynamics of, of a much more competitive yep. marketplace, whatever that is, yeah? And so what you get is you get unusual behaviors in an oligopoly. If you're an oligopoly, you are wired to protect your existing install base yes. rather than compete. I see what you mean, yeah. Right? Because if you have 10, 20, 30, 40% market share, the question really isn't how do I go from 40 to 45%. I mean, that's nice, of course, but yep. it's much more important to make sure that you keep the 40% keep new competitors out yes. and raise price with that existing install base. And so, you know, so for Honey, we're doing those things that are differently, but you have to understand that a lot of things we're doing are actually quite cannibalistic, meaning it wouldn't make sense for an incumbent yeah, okay. in an oligopoly. For example, there's something called a loyalty tax in mm -hmm. Australia, which is kind of, it's, you're from the UK. I am. Originally, this is illegal in the UK, what I'm about to tell illegal. you. Illegal? Okay? What I'm about to tell you. Not just not having illegal. No, it's illegal. So there's a loyalty tax, which means the average Australian is paying 27% more for home insurance, which is like five, 600 bucks on average mm. in Australia, um, than if they just called back their insurance company and said, give me a new price for my home, I'm still me in my house. Yeah. Okay, so if you're a loyal customer, you're paying 27% more for that same insurance company. So they literally take advantage of the fact that it's annoying to go shop around, you couldn't be bothered, it's all the same, like that mentality. And the implication is you're kind of getting fleeced, you're paying five, 600 bucks too much, right? <laughs> And so in the UK, they made loyalty taxes illegal. Many countries have, right? Yep. Australia is not the case. And so, you know, if people literally spent two minutes shopping around, checking out the price of honey insurance versus whoever, you know, many of those people would save, you know, five, six hundred bucks is a lot of money, right? It's a lot so, of money. so yeah. partially, I think the things that we're doing wouldn't make sense for an incumbency if you're an oligopoly because you you really are wired appropriately so to protect your existing install yep. base. You're not there to like invest deeply in a specific vertical or eliminate structural ways that you work right now that could erode your margins. It wouldn't make sense. You know, I think you've not just answered a question about insurance. You've answered an age-old question I've been asking people since I started this show. Yeah. Which is why Australia is always so far behind everyone else. Because I say to people, I understand that if you go back to when you had to come here on a ship, <laughs> it took two months to get here. Sure. Of course you're going to be behind, right? The information is yeah. not there. But we don't, we don't have to come on a ship. We go on a plane. It takes yeah. less than a day. So why are we still behind? Now you've just explained it because nearly every industry in Australia is, is wired to maintain rather than innovate. 
Yes, I think, listen, I, I think that there is a truth to that for sure. Um, and I think there, there's a few things that go into that stew, right? And this is obviously my anecdotal thoughts yep. having come here from America. And, and you know, I, I built my first company. I was in London um, building European offices for a few years. So I've, I've certainly played around in many countries. And yep. the, the issue with Australia is that it's big enough. You can make a lot of money and it makes sense. Yep. But it's never a top five or ten priority for any no. company, right? So if you have a high growth, sexy company in America, you go to England or Canada, then Germany, if you're really edgy, you'll go to India or China. You know, no one's like, go to Australia. Because no. it's not big enough that it's a top 10 priority, no. even though it's very interesting and profitable. And I think the same goes for the Europeans or even the Chinese or the Japanese. Like, if you're going to go somewhere, you're not thinking Australia. So what ends up happening is, is that um, they kind of never come, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's just, take, and so it's actually, but it's really interesting. It, it, it's a big enough country you can do super well. Australians are very technically savvy, like early adopters. It's got all the right ingredients to be successful here. It's just not a big enough addressable market that it's a priority. And so the implication is that Australia, in many ways, doesn't have the competition you'd have yeah. in a place like America or England. Um, so if you do choose to focus on it, I think you do incredibly well. And it's welcomed. Like Aussies want to do stuff that's cutting edge. They want to yeah, play with innovation. It's not like the society doesn't want to do it. It's like, just not enough. Uh, Aussies punch above the belt in adoption. They just don't have the options, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go back a bit to you. Sure. You mentioned earlier you're from San Francisco. You mentioned you worked in London. So there's some history here. So, sure. you know, what, I guess, tell me a little bit of history about your journey, how you ended up sort of getting into building businesses, how you ended up in London, how you yeah. ended up here. Uh, so I, I grew up between South Africa and Canada, believe it or not. So Gosh, you really have got around. <laughs> a little bit, yes, in a nice way. Um, <laughs> so part of the colonies that you, that you created, I guess. And uh, so I went from South Africa, grew up South Africa, Canada, yep. left when I was um, just post-university. I did some banking and consulting. It yep. uh, wasn't my shtick, but I learned a lot. Um, and so I did tech M&A at Morgan Stanley and did some time at McKinsey. Mm -hmm. And decided I wanted to build. And so I was here with McKinsey at the time. I was yep. maybe... I don't know, 23, 24. And so I started my first company in Australia, which mm -hmm. was called Park Assist, uh, which is all these green and the red lights. That I shows remember you this company. Your, yeah. And they're still used today. They're, they're, they're I love still it. used it's today. Great business. Saving seven minutes a day for about 100 million people. So whatever that means. Um, <laughs> and so I started it here, but I ended up um, moving to London, creating offices there. And then head office became New York. Yep. Um, I built it to about, about 20 countries. We had operations in some shape or form. And then I sold it to a public company in Europe, TKH, <clears throat> and married a Sydney girl based in New York, moved to San Francisco to be kind of closer to Australia, yep. and um, started a second company there called Stella. Mm -hmm. And my idea was, I know you're in the HR recruiting game, so my idea was, can we automate recruiting departments at large companies yep. by sharing candidates? So I kind of looked at the investment, let's say, in Coca-Cola's HR team, and you mm -hmm. go, hold on a minute. They're spending hundreds of millions building a brand to attract candidates. A human being is looking at all these resumes, 10% of them get interviewed and you hire one person. Yep. All that knowledge, that wastage. effort, it's wasted. Massive right? wastage. Totally, right? Criminal industry. So that to me looked like an asset. And I said, well, what if we connected all the recruiting departments across these big companies? Surely you'd be able to hire you know, way faster and with less people. Um, and so we got about 150 companies together. Seek invested. I had several recruiting companies invest in the States. Um, it was a really interesting company. And it started working actually much more in the hourly space. So kind of think um, like Australia Post, McDonald's, yeah, yeah. bank exactly. tellers, et cetera. Because the, the marketplace liquidity, so the ability to connect people from one job to the other is much higher if you're unskilled. Yep. You can imagine if someone's a salesperson at a pharmaceutical company that's big, they're not going to go to a small company that's selling software, even though that skill set yeah, there is crossover, but it's not as much. It turns out it's like less than 1%, oh, really? whereas it turns out it's 25% across unskilled. I did not know those numbers. Yeah, yeah. So, so matchmaking, as you would know, is actually very hard statistically very in the knowledge worker space. If you're a big company person, you don't want to work at a small company. If yep. you're in an industry, if the job's in Melbourne, only 8% of people are willing to move cities. So you kind of do the math, and it's yep. actually quite hard to find that, that match. And, um, and so that business scaled. Um, I went through a divorce, it was really tough, decided to bring the kids to Australia, mm -hmm. and kind of came here trying to figure out what I'd do with my life, um, and you know, stumbled into insurance really as being a really good example of an industry, I think, that's not sexy, but where there was a very clear, simple customer need. Yep. And certainly when I think about building businesses, I often think about 
at this point, at least with my gray hair, I think about three types of risks. You know, there's business model risk. So at Park Assist and Stella, I took a lot of business model risk. We mm -hmm. Building a new product, we didn't know if anyone would buy it. Yep. We took technology risk. So it's possible that the demand was there, people wanted it at that price point, but technically it might not have been possible yep. to actually solve those problems. Uh, and we took execution risk. You gotta build a team, raise the money, get your early customers, you know, all that good stuff, right? And I decided that I wanted to be disproportionately focused on execution risk. I didn't want to enter an industry where it was just a completely new idea and a new product yeah. to educate the market. And I didn't want to do something that was very technical because I felt that it would be probably hard in Australia. You know, in, in Stella, we had um, the former head of Jet Propulsion Labs, AI, was there. And we had the head of contextual analytics from the Pentagon. You have, like, meaningful okay. reservoirs of deeply talented people with, yeah. within the AI space, for example. It's harder to get that critical mass and harder to get funding here, I think, mm -hmm. for, for a it great... Is, oh, it's not a question. Yeah, um, for hard sciences. There's some folks doing great, a great job here. Um, you know, but, but, it, but it is very hard. So I thought, well, what is an industry where there's a very clear customer need, an existing industry where really if we execute well, we can do something special for local customers um, and most likely be successful. You know, I had two young kids. I didn't want to travel you know, internationally anymore. Uh, so insurance is super interesting because it was a big enough addressable market yeah. that I wouldn't have to end up on a plane back to the States all well, the time. It's everybody, right? It's everybody. Everyone has, well, pretty much everyone has something. Pretty much. 96% of homeowners, yeah. right? It's not even legal to have a mortgage without, without home insurance. So it's pervasive. Everyone gets the problem. Yep. No one's jumping up and down being like, I love my insurance company, you know? And so... <laughs> I haven't seen that yet. No. I haven't seen it yet. Well, we have. It's coming. We're working <laughs> on it. Here for, We're right? working on it. But yeah. And so, you know, checked all the boxes for me personally at this stage of my life where I didn't want to have to be on planes back to the States. I wanted to be able to execute the problem, not do a good job, but fail because the technology wasn't there or we couldn't hire the specialists. Yep. And so Honey Insurance checked all of those kind of boxes. Um, it is very, very hard, though, in Australia to become part of the oligopoly. Right? Yeah, well, they, they're hard. pretty good at keeping people out, right? I mean, like we talked yes. about, that's, that's what they're focused on, right? That's their superpower. Yeah, and you know, and it's hard to know, of course, how much of that is just structural versus intentional. Yeah. You know, candidly, I haven't, I don't know, but but the end result is the same. It's very hard for someone to open a new liquor distribution business here. Two companies control ninety whatever percent. It's yeah. very hard to create a new airline in Australia. It's very hard to create a new bank in Australia. So I think these are all very protected industries. It's very difficult to get in. Uh, home insurance is mostly controlled by five companies. Yep. You've got like 30, 40 brands underneath them, but there's five companies yeah, that know. control them when all. When you look at that, they're all, every time you, you can move companies and you're actually still with the same company. Yeah, it's like RSEV yep. and NRMA are all owned by IG. And you know, behind all these Woolworths insurance, so all of them are the same five, five companies for the most part. And so um, it's very hard to get to first base because home insurance is super profitable for them for the mm -hmm. most part. And so they're not going to support no. a new player coming in. And... If you want to play, it takes like three or four years to get approved as a new insurance company. Why does it take? It's like the bank thing. It's the same thing. The, pro yeah. the process to get approved yes. is incredibly complicated. Listen, if you, want to, if you wanted to defend it, you'd say Australian consumers need to be protected. The government's doing a great job. They don't want to let any new bank or insurance company enter. That's not sparkly was bank clean. If you want to be cynical, you'd say, hold on a minute. This clearly has gone too far. Yeah in prohibiting proper competition. And yes, while it's admirable to make sure people are protected, at some point, they're actually, there's a backward bending curve where consumers are actually overpaying, there's not enough competition. You know, it's kind of like freedom of speech, right? Where, where do you draw that line yeah. between where it starts to move into a space where it's actually not constructive anymore? Mm. Um, and, I, and I think we haven't really given a lot of thought to that, I think domestically, is my sense. No, I don't think people have. Yeah. So tell me, where's the name come from? I want, I've been wanting to ask this since the beginning. I'm dying to know. <laughs> where does it go? I mean, uh, is yeah. it because it's sticky? We, I w yes, I, <laughs> I think well, that's a good idea. I, I, <laughs> in the early days, we wanted something that, the, the truth is that we wanted something that was cute and different and cut through. Mm -hmm. um, but it also couldn't be, it couldn't be milkshake. It couldn't be something silly because, you know, you're buying insurance, it has to be credible. So there's yep. some fine balance. When I looked around at the industry, the number one thing I saw was that people deserved a sweeter deal. Like, I people love. are overpaying, <laughs> they're not getting enough service. The average Australian calls their home insurance company, has to outbound call 14 times to get a claims dealt with, right? So it's just, uh. And so people just deserve a sweeter deal and sweeter experience, you know? And so Honey, to me, was really the output of that, which was, this is kind of a yucky feeling in the industry right now. Yeah. Everyone's 
at best, kind of throwing their hands in the air and going, ugh, whatever. <laughs> and, you know, we can do better and we can make it a bit sweeter, right? And I think if we can build something in Australia that we're proud of, that becomes a really interesting opportunity to kind of export that from Australia elsewhere in time. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and I think it's important to put Australia on the map for innovation for all of our sakes, you know, in the long haul, right? Cool. In, in a little way. I like it. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. All right, talk to me. Um, you've been going how long? So we launched in June of 2021. Yeah. So our three year anniversary three is pretty much bang two, on three now. months ago. Nearly, yes. That's I won't be jumping out of a cake um, will you quite will? yet. I won't be. I was going to say, because if you will yes. or are, we want to film it. Uh, <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> we definitely I will want to film it. I keep my clothes on and not be in a cake um, for the anniversary, <laughs> I can assure you. Uh, so yeah, two or three months' time will be our three years. That's, that's cool. How, yeah. that's so, and look, you've just done a massive raise. Yeah. And you've won an absolute plethora of awards during that time. Yeah. So, you know, you haven't just sort of snuck in. You've come in with a, with a bang, right? We've tried to do it. I've tried to do it my way. But, well, yeah. that's good. So yeah. talk to me about, um, you know, you talk about how hard it is to break into these industries. What's been the hardest, what's been the hardest thing? And, and on, you know, to counter that, what's actually been something that surprised you in terms of how quickly or easy it was? Um, Look, I think what's, what's been, I'll start with what's been good, yep. I think. I've been very pleasantly surprised by the technical uh, talent in Australia. I think in America, like Aussies are very, they downplay how hard they work, they downplay how good they are, I think a lot. Maybe it's tall, part of tall poppy syndrome, maybe it's that they don't, they're not out there, Germany's not next to Italy, next to England, maybe it's, they, yeah, they're, maybe. they're not in a pressure cooker, I don't know why, but you know, in America, if someone works one day until midnight, they'll say they work three days till midnight. In Australia, if they work three days till midnight, they'll tell you they didn't at all. Yeah. And, you know, the number of times I've heard in San Francisco, I'm a 10x engineer, you know. Uh. And I don't think I've heard that once in Australia. <laughs> I've you know? never heard that expression. Yeah. Really? Yeah, 100%. That's a terrible thing. Absolutely, right. And so people there really do a lot of chest beating, a lot of self-promotion. You don't really see that here. No. And so I've been really pleasantly surprised. We've hired an incredible team. They honestly are world class and could compete with the best back in San Francisco or in Europe. Um, and so I've been super impressed by that. Yep, great work statement. ethic, great technical um, base. And um, so that's been really good. I, and because the competition is lower, you know, churn is lower. You're not constantly competing with the next Netflix, Uber, Lyft. Yep. People True. stick around. There's not that many interesting companies to work at if you're really talented, no. I think. And so it's, it, there's a lot of talent. Yeah, I think what's been very hard is, you know, in order to get a startup off the ground, you really have to get three or four airplanes to land at the same time, mm -hmm. as, you, as you know, right? You've got to get a team that's willing to jump ship from their original companies and take meaningful pay, pay cuts. Yep. You need to raise funding, and you need to get some early customers on board. And in our case, there was also regulatory complexities and a few other things, right? In insurance, like we needed an underwriter. So I'm we sure. had to get four airplanes. Those airplanes all have to land within six months or so. Meaning you can't have people start and not have the funding. No. You can't get the funding and not get the underwriting. Yep. <laughs> and you can't get the funding and the underwriting but not have a team because they won't wire the money. So, you know, so it was, what was very difficult was getting those four airplanes to land at the same time. The underwriter didn't want to sign unless everyone else was investing. No one would right. invest without them. The team wouldn't quit their jobs unless those things were in line. And the early customers were like, well, we're not going to give you a time. We're going to work together or launch, right? And so I had to kind of, it took me 18 months to get those four things together mm. into a window. And even then, I had to like bridge finance in the early days for the first, I don't know, nine months, 10 months. So, you know, so it's very complicated to get, I would say, certainly a B2B business off the ground in Australia in a way that would be easier in America. Yeah. Because there's limited capital, limited early adopters, there's limited executives you can hire. Yeah, who have and done the, a the funding's de there's definitely a greater risk appetite in the US. I think pretty much everywhere around, maybe other than, other than Singapore, there's a greater risk appetite for funding, I think, overseas. I think, I think there's two different components to that, right? I think part of it is, is what is the size of the pool of capital you can go and source from, but yep. just the number of venture investors and investors in general. And of course, understandably, it's much more in America. You know, that's just the size of market. Um, I think the second part, though, is the conviction I have found. In America, there's a small number of people you will meet, depending on the industry, that are just high conviction. Yep. They don't care what other people say. They're happy to be contrarians. They're happy to make a bet, and a big bet, and yep. say, you know what, Steve, I get what you're doing. I don't care who else is in. Let's go build this thing. Yeah. Not everyone, but a small group do that. Very, very, very hard to find high conviction investors, I found in Australia. Yeah. Right? You know, a lot of them are like, well, who else is in? 
There's a lot of that. There's yeah. a lot of that here. And in order to get a startup off the ground, you need, you need a couple or one high conviction investor who's like, you know what? I believe in you. I believe in the team. I get the problem. Let's go do this thing. I struggled a lot with that over here, right? So mm -hmm. I kind of had to cobble together strategics and the underwriter and different partners. You know, even on this round, I, I scoured the planet. It's a big round. Yeah. How many did you talk to? So I, in the end, I went to 306 investors. <laughs> um, when, do, you, do you actually count? Like, do you stop at like 180? How do you know it's 306? Or did you do that in retrospect? Uh, yeah, I, was, that was not the goal. <laughs> um, you know, the goal would have been to speak to one investor. Yeah. So I spoke to 306. and That's a lot. Yeah, I, I don't know anyone who's done more than 70 or 80. No, that's, so. I don't think I've had enough. Not, not in Australia. That seems like a lot. Yeah, well, sorry, they weren't in Australia, just no, to be clear. I mean, I spoke to everyone in Australia, but that would have been dozens. Yeah. Um, then I went to Singapore. I went to Tel Aviv in Israel. I went to the UK, Sweden. Um, I, I spoke to one or two in Korea. I spoke to a bunch in China. Obviously, San Francisco, New York. Um, listen, it's very hard because I think if you want to raise three to fifteen million dollars, and you're a first-time founder, and you kind of fit into those boxes yep. where you're raising three to fifteen, you've got product market fit, mm -hmm. you're doing an X million in, in ARR, and you're going to dilute thirty percent for the round. That's clean in Australia. You can get that done. Yeah. If you need to raise thirty to fifty million. It's actually no man's land. There's not a lot of traditional, probably almost any growth investing here, I would say. And so the problem we fell into at Honey was we had this hyper growth company that was taking off. Mm -hmm. The economics are great. It's a very seasoned team. It's, you know, I've started and sold two already. So we kind of knew what we were doing. But we, so we couldn't raise 30 to 50 million locally. There wasn't anyone to really yeah. speak to. And when you go internationally, they want to do minimum checks of 50 million and ideally 100 US. So we were kind of too early, you know, we yeah. did that in the end, but we struggled a lot because we were a bit too early, I think, for the global players, or 12 months too early. And we were quite aggressive and, and I would say, really too big for the locals. Mm. And so we were stuck in this um, strange position. It was, really, it was really hard. And I didn't want to do a small round locally. We would have done that, of course. Um, and nor did we want to raise you know, hundreds of millions and, and totally dilute the business, right? Yeah. So we're in no man's land. But in the end, we raised, uh, it was 108 million was, was the headline. Um, and we have an amazing partner. They kind of get insurance. They get financial services. They're patient. They get the space. Um, and there were a lot of others in that round. I was going to say, how, was the one sort of real cornerstone or was it? Yeah, this company but... called Gallatin Point. Yep. They, were the, they were the primary investors that led the round. Yep. And then we had a whole bunch of strategics from you know, from Harvey Norman and McGraw to Aqualand right. uh, that all kind of came in with checks of, you know, two to seven million, let's yeah. say. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, but cobbling it together was, it was very tough and very complex and, and it was very distracting, right? Like at the end of the day. It is very distracting. It, it's difficult to keep the business operating if you're spending, you know, honestly 80 hours a week on fundraising, right? That's a lot. <laughs> But yeah. it's the difference of getting it done or not. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, the difference between success and failure is much more thin than people understand, I think. I and, agree with that. Um, and you have to show up. You can go to, if you want to go to the Olympics, you're going to have to train until your body breaks every single day. Mm. It's kind of my view on this. And yeah. so, you know, we want to build a business that's worth a couple billion dollars over the course of the next three to four years. And, you know, that's like taking an NRMA from 50 years and compressing it into five. Yep. Well, that's a violent blood sport that's going to be very painful. Mm. And you're delusional if you think otherwise. You're not going to get home at 6 o'clock, Monday to Friday, not travel. And my gosh, it's, it's not true, right? It, it's going to be very hard. And, and, and so I think that was the outcome. If I was happy to speak to only 70 funds, then I would have raised 10 million on 110. And the business would be in a different place. Yeah. Right. So now it is where it is. Now it is where you're it smiling. is. I, well, we survived. <laughs> yeah, and, and you're not doing any more right now. I will never raise another round, certainly in this company and maybe ever. But yeah. So let's talk about what it's going to go on. What's, what's new? What's happening? What's, what's, what's happening with Honey? What's the big announcements? What's the, big... uh, the biggest announcement? So, we, so June 5th, uh, LD Insurance launch, uh, which is super exciting. Woolworths and Kohl's have been you know, wonderfully successful in insurance. LD is the fifth largest retailer in the world. Is that right? Quarter of a million people. They own Trader Joe's in America. I mean, they're massive, right? Uh, they own Asda in, mm -hmm. um, in, in 
Oh, sorry, Aldi is Aldi in, in, the, in the UK. But so they're, they're but they're a huge brand, and and so we're super excited to partner with them. They're all about being different, and Honey's all about being different. Uh, they've got an incredible brand. Their team has been honestly incredible to work with. And so the idea is, can we go and build a new version of what Woolworths and Coles have done for insurance, and, yep. and start to take the LD brand out to that customer base? So, uh, and we think LD customers are going to be very receptive to kind of a better and fairer and simpler deal, right? Yeah, in general. Absolutely. So that, that's a huge coup that's taken us well, that's, two and a half years of work. That's yeah. the tag. I mean, all their customers should be just jumping. You would think that the yeah. adoption rate within their customer base will be. Like honey, is a, honey is a great fit within the LD customer base, I think, for that reason, honestly. Um, they want a better, fair, simpler dealer deal, and, and Honey is quite literally, like, that's the yeah. value we stand for. So we're, we're pumped about that. We're also super excited to be working with their team. Like, they're just, they're exceptional, honestly. Yeah. Um, so that, that's been wonderful. Uh, we're scaling as well, so we're hiring a lot. We've, we're up to about 110 people now, and we'll probably be closer to 200 in less than a year. So the business is... You know, ramping up. Yeah. And are they local? Are they all over the world? Everyone's they... in Sydney. Yep. Uh, they're all here. I, I'm a big believer in um, building together, suffering together, winning together, all of that. You know, so I think you all kind of have to be in it, sitting next to each other, yep. eating your own dog food. Like, you really need to be in it. Yeah. And I think that's part of what is important as we scale the business. For as long as we can, we need to keep it as tribal as we can. Yep. Where everyone knows everyone. You mixing the contact center, sitting next to engineering and design. We're trying to keep everyone as close to understanding what makes the business work as possible. You lose that at some point. You become a bigger company. But I think we have to fight tooth and nail to keep try that, and keep yeah. that tribal intent and, and try to keep the the fireside chats. And, Are you all in this, you know? we're in this space? So we're currently all in this space. Yeah, yeah. if it's about 70 people. Uh, originally, we came into the space. I mean, I would rather sleep in this space than sleep in my house. Candidly, it's so beautiful. It is beautiful. Um, it is beautiful. Um, so originally, the idea was, well, we don't want to have to browbeat people into coming into the office a couple of days a week, which I think is really important. And now, if anything, the problem is the inverse, where it's like, hey, Steve, you need to go home now. Maybe you can only come in three days, not five, right? And so, Stop eating the free fruit. Totally. Move away from the fruit. Yeah, there's been a bit of that. Um, but it's listen, we've built an amazing culture. Um, it really is an amazing culture. It's so interesting. I tried to intentionally create or force, I should say, cultural norms in my first two companies. Mm -hmm. And on, you know, when I look back, I kind of cringe at some of the things I try to do. Um, you know, every, <laughs> once a month movie night and all these things. Come on, what's the, what's, the, what's the worst one you reckon? Even you, even you said to yourself, I can't believe I did that. Uh, we used to have uh, my first company at Park Assist, you know, we try to do like once a month, some like movie night, bowling night. You know, and I didn't have kids at the time, and I was living in yep. New York. And, and so you really don't understand how this works for normal people. Now, on reflection, I'm like, you know, at home with three kids. Like, the idea that I would show up to yeah, a company bowling event that's quote-unquote quote, quote kind of mandatory on a Tuesday night. <laughs> you're like, really? I'm not Get home this. at 11 p.m.? I'm like, what was I thinking? Yeah. So, you know, but now what's really interesting is, is that when you build a company that's got such strong values, and when you interview for that... The irony is that the culture just takes care of itself. Yeah. And I never really understood that. And so, need to force it. Totally. But, but I've really grown into that serendipitously. And so I think, um, you know, we have culture club internally and they set the bar on what we're doing and how we're doing it. And we have a lot of activities. But, you know, we've got all these interesting little things that are formed. Like, as people go, um, um, like, mountain climbing and, yep. and all that, you know, bouldering together. There's like 20 people doing bouldering. And, you know, so people have broken off into these groups not because we've forced it or subsidized it. The, the culture should just be some, become so clear because we've been so intentional with the type of culture and yeah. values we have that everything else is taking care of itself. People want to hire their friends. They don't particularly want to leave. Um, I really didn't understand that when I was younger, I think. I don't think a lot of people do. I think, yeah, I think you, know, you see a lot of young founders trying to do exactly what you tried to do, yeah. right? They're trying to force this culture. But it yeah. does. It, you, 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 the whole company doesn't need to be together all the time. Totally. Because that's not realistic either. Yeah. You know, people find their little bits within the bigger tribe and then they yeah. go off and do their bit. Their, what they do is like, it's like a school totally. in some respects. 100% right. Yeah, you yeah. know, um, 100% right. So I, I think I've learned the hard way that it's, it is so, so important to make sure that on the way in, you get the values yeah. and the culture right, and then you won't have to clean up the mess later on by trying to figure out how you create. And they almost that police tissue. it for you, right? Hundred percent. That's the best part, right? When they start yeah. policing it for you, and people go, "There's 
no dickhead rule, and there's a dickhead you hide over here. And yeah, you know, he's, he's had a couple of swings, but he's got one more, and then we're, he, we we want him out, kind of thing. Listen, That's how I do. Ape, like we have a fairly um, unforgiving culture, I would say, and the reason is because A players don't particularly like B players. No. Right? <laughs> like, that's the unpolitical truth, right? Yeah. And so we're quite militant with trying to hire, like, the best people we can find. Yeah. And the implication of that is that they don't really want to be sitting next to somebody who's piecing out at 4.30 and not going the extra mile and isn't really that exceptional and isn't that kind and all those, all those things that we stand for. Um, and so, as you said, it becomes self-policing. Yeah. But you have to be very militant because when it's 10 people in the company, then you're hiring the next 30. Now it's 40. You go from 40 to the 100, then 100 to 300. Like it's, it gets tough. It's, it's going to get harder and harder, exactly right, as that command of control starts to, to fragment. And so you have to hold the line super, mm. super hard in the early days, I think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, how good. What a great story. Thank you. Um, and still so early and so many new bits to come. True. So we've got a new thing now where we're going to come back and see you in about... 12, 18 months. We've been doing okay. this. We've, we've been going three years. We started to do that with some of the ones we've done before. And it's super interesting. I might be bald. There's nothing wrong with that. Can we just, <laughs> just cover that off? Um, I might, you never know. With the way medicines go, I might have a You might hair. have gray hair. I'll be bald. <laughs> True. But um, it's really interesting to come back and talk to people um, later and find out what's happened. And, you know, because no yeah. one really knows what's going to happen. So True. I'm looking forward to that. Well, but, um, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. And Likewise. I look forward to, uh, to seeing the Aldi thing kick off. Likewise. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching, everyone. So nice to be in this beautiful office space. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe, and we'll see you next week.